podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. This month, we're returning to our listener library for a series of episodes suggested by you, our mysterious listeners. Gary writes... One suggestion, if you haven't talked about it yet, there's an episode of Suspense called Flesh Peddler that stars DeForest Kelly. Since you are Star Trek fans, this may interest you. You probably know also that one of the great cartoon voices of all time, Dawes Butler, is in that show. He is using the same voice he would later use for his Mr. Jinx character in Pixie and Dixie. Keep up the fine work. You have a new fan here. One of radio's most prestigious and longest-running shows, Suspense premiered on CBS Radio in 1942 and ran for another 20 years. Known for its big-name stars, high production values, and sophisticated scripts, Suspense raised the bar for dramatic radio. By the mid-1950s, though, Suspense began to struggle with a shrinking listenership thanks to competition from television. The departure of longtime sponsor Autolite led to a reduction in budget as well. No longer able to afford A-list Hollywood talent producer William N. Robeson used this reversal of fortune to his advantage, turning it into an opportunity to recruit new and exciting talent. Gary mentioned two of those talents in his email, DeForest Kelly and Dawes Butler. Ironically, at the time of this suspense broadcast, DeForest Kelly was appearing alongside former suspense stars Burt Lancaster and Kirk Douglas in the gunfight at the OK Corral. Over the next 10 years, Kelly would continue to appear in supporting roles in both film and television before landing his most famous role, Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy in Star Trek. This episode of Suspense is one of Kelly's rare radio appearances. Before Dawes, Butler became famous as the voice of Yogi Bear, Elroy Jetson, Quick Draw McGraw, Snagglepuss, Huckleberry Hound, and many more, he worked on several comedy albums with friend and collaborator Stan Freeberg, including St. George and the Dragonette, a spoof of Dragnet, which became the first comedy record to sell over a million copies. Butler also appeared on Freeberg's radio series The Stan Freeberg Show, which ran on CBS July through October 1957 as a summer replacement for The Jack Benny Show. That same year, Jack Hanna and William Barbera formed their own animation company, and the rest is cartoon history. This was also the first professional script by a young writer named Robert Juran. During the 1970s, Juran contributed over 30 plays to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. And now... Let's listen to Flesh Peddler from Suspense, originally aired August 4th, 1957. It's late at night and a chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker, listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Suspense. And the producer of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, the master of mystery and adventure, William N. Robeson. One of the greatest pleasures we find in this business of keeping you in suspense is the discovery of new talent and of unusual story twists. In what you're about to hear, we think we have combined both. The twist, you'll never guess it, no matter how familiar you are with that mystical literary device, the ventriloquist dummy. And the new talent, two young men, Bob Jorn, whose first radio play this is, and DeForest Kelly, a bright new luminary in the Hollywood firmament. Put them all together, and you have a strange half hour ahead. Listen. Listen, then, as DeForest Kelly stars in Flesh Peddler, which begins in exactly one minute. It took mighty men to conquer mighty America, and the men set before themselves even mightier heroes, some real, some not. For instance, there was the legendary keelboatman, Mike Fink. Now, let Mike tell you about himself. I'm a salt river roarer. I'm a ring-tailed squealer. I'm a regular screamer from the old Mississippi. Whoop! 
I'm the very infant that refused his milk before its eyes was open and called out for a bottle of old rye. I love the women and I'm chock full of fight. I'm half wild horse and half cockeyed alligator. I can hit like fourth proof lightning and every lick I make in the woods lets in an acre of sunshine. I can outrun, out jump, out shoot, out brag, out drink and out fight. Any man from Pittsburgh to New Orleans and back again to St. Louis. Come on, you flatters, you bodgers, you milk-white mechanics, and see how tough I am to chaw. I ain't had a fight for two days, and I'm spiling for exercise. cock a doo doo, -doo. <laughs> Folklore belongs to every nation's legendary past. And I guess we Americans have our share of some tall ones. And now... Mr. DeForest Kelly in Flesh Peddler. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. I'm an agent. A booking agent. Flesh peddlers, we are sometimes unkindly called. But I don't peddle flesh... I sell talent, singers, musicians, nightclub acts, and I'm pretty good at it. I've got an instinct for talent. When I find a new act that's really got it, I go after it until it's mine. Only the ventriloquist team of Wilson and Oliver, I wish I'd never heard of them. Then I could sleep better nights. My wife and I were vacationing in the Catskills last summer, and the night before we were due back in New York, a carnival pulled into town. Now, I don't want to sound like a snob, but to me, the carnival is the lowest form of show business. I hate them. But my wife, Gloria, loves them. Since I love Gloria, we went to the carnival. Pete, isn't it exciting? It's just cheap noise. Oh, I wish it had come to town sooner. I wish it hadn't come till tomorrow. Oh, come on, Pete. You might even find some new talent. Here? Why not? The freaks are for sideshows, honey, not class spots. You never can tell. A bearded lady might go great at the coca. Hey, hey, I can hey, tell. Hey, folks, right here for the wonder of the midway. Hey, the one and only Alexander Wilson and his lovable little dummy pal, Oliver. Hey, you've seen Ben Philippus before, you say. Uh-huh. Hey, but you've never seen anything to equal Wilson. The remarkable Wilson and Oliver. Hey, don't pass us by, friend. Pete, don't let's go in. Oh, oh but ventriloquist, a dime a dozen. Come on, I want to see him. Honey, you've seen a hundred just like him. Well, maybe he's one in a hundred. All right, all right. We pushed through into the small tent and took our places on the hard, uncomfortable benches. Wilson was already seated on the platform, a typical childishly dressed dummy on his lap. He was a man in his fifties, I'd say, with the saddest face I've seen in 15 years of show business. When the people were in, he suddenly sprang the dummy to life. Shut the doors, shut the doors. All president accounted for, Mr. Wilson. You're sure, Oliver? Sure. But then... Say hello to the people. Hello to the people. Oh, now, come, Oliver. You can do better than that. I can? Yes. Well, you ought to know. <laughs> <laughs> the routine was awful. Dull, time-worn. But for some reason, this Wilson fascinated me. He had a talent all right. His handling of the dummy was amazingly accurate. As the act went on, I began to think that Wilson was even better than the Barker had said he was. And he was going over with the house. Wilson had Oliver sing while he himself smoked a cigarette. After a few more gag routines and a couple of neat tricks, the performance was over, and I knew I had to sign the act. I parked Glory on the merry-go-round and then went looking for Wilson. I walked back of the midway through the maze of painted trailers that were home to carny people. Suddenly the door to one of them flew open and a woman stepped out, a neatly trimmed beard covering her chin. What do you want? I'm looking for Alexander Wilson. Wilson? Why? I'm a talent agent from New York. I'd like to talk to him. Agent? Yes, Peter Harris, and you're... Bernice, it's on the posters. Oh, yes, of course, Bernice. What do you want with Alexander Wilson? Well, I told oh, you I... Oh, who is it, Bernice? Talent agent, 
Never mind, go back in. Uh, uh, a- agent? I'm looking for Mr. Wilson. Oh, uh, well, I'm Arthur. Uh, you caught my knife act. Y- you know, I could pin a fly to a penny of four feet. Quiet. Don't mind him, flesh peddler. Go away. Go home. Agents are no good for us. Leave Wilson alone. And, and you know, uh, like I could put out a candle flame with a pen knife at 30 feet, Agent Man. Arthur? And go back in. Uh, maybe he could sell my act. Go in. All right. Uh, Wilson's in trailer 17, Agent Man. Hey, if you ever need a, a good Shut up, knife Arthur. To... George. Shut up. Get in there. Forget what he said. Arthur is... Well, he isn't quite bright. You know what I mean? Yeah. What's so wrong about seeing Wilson? There are plenty of acts like his. You don't need him. Well, you've got my curiosity going now, Bernice. I hadn't intended that. But forget your curiosity. And go home. Now. Why? Believe me, flesh peddler, you will thank me for this advice someday. Which is trailer 17? I couldn't see why Bernice was so huffy. It was none of her business anyway. I roamed through the trailers with my cigarette lighter held high, looking for number 17. Finally, I found it. A small aluminum antique set apart from the rest, with a pre-war Chevy attached to it. The trailer was completely dark. Mr. Wilson. What is it? I'm Peter Harris. I'd like to talk to you. What do you want? Well, I'm an agent, Mr. Wilson. I'd like to see you. Just a minute. Yes? I just caught your act, Mr. Wilson. I enjoyed it very much. Thank you. I'd like to do business with you. Do business? Here's my card. My office places acts on all four networks and all the principal nightclubs. I'm afraid it's out of the question. I I never play nightclubs. But... Because I never play nightclubs, Mr. Harris. Well, could I come in for a moment, explain my setup? Maybe when you... No, forgive me for appearing short, but I... I'm not interested in any offer you have to make. To begin with, I can get you 200 a week. Oh, excuse me. 250? Well, I'm very tired, if you'll pardon me. Okay, Mr. Wilson. But will you tell me why you want to stay with a two-bit freak show when you could make a small fortune working with me? No. No, I'm afraid I can't tell you. Good night. I suppose I should have forgotten all about it, but I'm not used to the brush off. Like I say, when I see an act I want, I go after it until I get it. And then there was something about Wilson's reluctance that wasn't somehow on the level. As I walked back toward the bright lights and the noise of the midway, a figure stepped from behind one of the darkened trailers. So you saw him? Oh, Bernice. Yes, I saw him. And are you satisfied? Not at all. Just more curious. Exactly. Only fools push their noses into other people's business, flesh peddler. Um, Harris is the name. And only fools get themselves and other people into trouble. Trouble? All I wanted was to offer him a nice fat job, $2.50 a week, and he slammed the door in my face. Alexander Wilson cannot leave this carnival. Why? You don't know, Mr. Harris, and you're not going to know. Know what? Stop asking foolish questions. Your curiosity can do a great deal of harm. Bernice, where does the carnival go from here? Really, Mr. Harris, you don't expect me to... Look, I can ask any one of the Barkers or set-up men. Ask them, then. All right, I will. But remember, Flesh Peddler, if you follow us to Poughkeepsie, I'll... Poughkeepsie? Very well, now you know. But if you follow us and try to see Wilson again, you are a fool. In just a moment, we continue with... Suspense. One of the more colorful lumberjacks of the Midwest was a lad named Whiskey Jack. Sort of fellow who could single-handed lick an entire logging crew or swim one of the Great Lakes with one hand tied behind his back. But as in all heroes' lives, there came a tender moment. As legend recalls, Whiskey Jack was not much for learning. Certainly couldn't write his name. It was always the big X that he made on any slip of paper. Then one day he came in quiet like, a little subdued. And when they gave him his pay envelope, he signed for it with great deliberation. The clerk looked, stopped, and called out, Hey, Jack, why the two X's? Whiskey Jack replied, 
Why, son, I have just met me a lovely young lady in the next river town, and we was hitched. So I thought it only proper and fitting that a married man should change his name. <laughs> Folklore belongs to every nation's legendary past, and I guess we Americans have some good ones. And now... We continue with the second act of Flesh Peddler, starring Mr. DeForest Kelly. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Gloria and I drove back to Manhattan the next morning. And two days later, I hopped a Poughkeepsie local out of Grand Central. The more I thought about Wilson, the more of a challenge he became. I wanted him for my list, but more than that, I wanted to find out what was behind Bernice's strange attitude. Now I wish I'd forgotten about the whole thing. In Poughkeepsie, I checked into a hotel, took a cab to the carnival grounds at the edge of town. It was late afternoon as I pulled up in front of the gaudy tents and booths, waiting for the evening crowds. I made my way through the cluttered midway, looking for Wilson's aluminum trailer and hoping I wouldn't run into Bernice... Yo! Agent man. Uh, hey, hey, agent man. Uh, hello. Hello. Uh, remember me, uh, Arthur the knife thrower? I can pin a fly to a penny. Yes, I, I remember you. And you've uh, come for me? What's that? Uh, you, you come all this way to get me for your agency? Well, no, I'm afraid not. Oh. Uh, well, that's all right. I mean... You know, like, I've been giving it a lot of thought, and uh, I don't think I could go with you anyway. <laughs> I see. So I, I couldn't leave Bernice in the carnival. Uh, my sister uh, says carny folk should stay with carny folk. Your sister? Bernice. Oh. Arthur, why is Bernice so, so close-mouthed about Mr. Wilson? She acts as though she's afraid of him. Uh, well, us carny folks uh, stick together, see? Like, we, we don't like other people sticking their noses into our business. Bernice said that? Yes. Arthur, where's Mr. Wilson's trailer? I don't know. Oh, come now, Arthur. Uh, Bernice says, you know... Uh, I know. Bernice says too much. Uh, I, I don't know anything, Agent Man. Well, I have to go practice my knife throwing now. I got to practice every day, you know, you know. Well, it was clear Bernice had given Arthur his instructions, and no thanks to him, I finally found Wilson's trailer set off from the rest. Mr. Wilson? Mr. Wilson! The door to the trailer was unlocked, and it swung open at my knock. Wilson obviously wasn't there, but I didn't think he'd mind if I went in and waited. The inside of the trailer was dim and musty. I left the door open to let in what little sunlight the day had left and sat in the lone chair in front of the makeup table. I was just about to reach for a cigarette when I had the feeling that I wasn't alone. I turned slowly in the chair and the back of my neck began to crawl. There on a shabby army cot was Wilson's dummy, propped up against the wall. The steady, unchanging expression of its face with the staring eyes and painted smile ran back at me. It was weird and uncomfortable to be so close to this lifeless thing, unmoving, wooden, it seemed so real and alive on the platform in the tent. I tried to ignore it, but I couldn't. I looked away, but I could still feel it there, grinning at me in the early evening dimness. When I could stand it no longer, I got up and walked out of the trailer and bumped right into Bernice. What did I tell you, flesh peddler? Bernice, I... What were you doing in there? Waiting for Wilson. What did I tell you? Now look, Bernice... I don't like you or anyone else telling me what I can or can't do. I want to see Wilson come with again. Me. He... I'm waiting here. You come with me, please. I must talk to you privately in my trailer. Sit down. Well, what's on your mind, Bernice? I didn't really think you'd follow us. I told you I'm not easily discouraged. Mr. Harris, I must warn you again to leave now without seeing Wilson. I don't think you understand me. I'm used to getting what I go Mr. after. Mr. Harris. I intend to see Wilson to try to talk him into signing a contract. 
and you've said so far, all that you've said is go away. Can you give me a good reason for not seeing him? Okay, then why did you insist on dragging me in here? Mr. Harris, can you assure me your interest in Wilson does not go beyond signing him as a client? What do you mean? Your interest in Wilson wouldn't by chance be in his past, his private life, and not in his professional talent. I never heard of him until I caught his act three days ago. Mr. Harris, I'd hoped I wouldn't have to tell you this. I didn't realize you were so stubborn, but... Yes? Well, Alexander Wilson lost his mind many years ago. That doesn't disturb you. It might, if I believed you, Bernice. What? I don't think Wilson's nuts. Apparently something's bothering him. Something big, maybe, but it's not insanity. I suppose you know Wilson better than I do. I didn't say that. But a man in my business meets every kind of person there is. The cheats, the phonies, the right guys, the bums. So? So you develop an instinct about people. And my instinct tells me Wilson is not insane. You'll have to try something better to scare me off. Mr. Harris, Wilson thinks he's a murderer. You are trying to scare me, aren't you? If that's necessary to protect you and us, yes. You think he might murder me, too? I don't mean that. Actually, he never murdered anyone. Look, Bernice, you don't make sense. Don't you understand? No. I said Alexander Wilson thinks he is a murderer. He thinks he murdered a woman a long time ago. He's lived with this thought for years, nourished it, until he really believes it. It's driven him out of his mind. Bernice, do you expect me to believe a cockamamie story like that? It's the truth. So don't you see... The only place for him is here, in the carnival, with his own kind. We understand Well, hasn't anyone tried to help him to make him realize that... He is beyond that now. But with us, he's all right. Outsiders disturb him. You haven't scared me off, Bernice. You've got to stay away from him. Why? If anything you've told me is true, it's only half the truth. It's enough for you to know. From you, maybe. Perhaps Wilson will tell me the rest. I've warned you. I will not warn you again. Oh, Bernice... Oh, hello again, Agent Man. Hi, Arthur. How's your throwing arm? Well, uh... Come in, Arthur. Mr. Harris is just leaving. Yes. So long, Bernice. Goodbye, Mr. Harris. When the trailer door closed behind me, I guess Bernice would start talking her fury out on Arthur. So I moved around to the small window in the back of the trailer to see if I could learn anything more. I don't care. I don't even want you to say hello to him. Nothing. Understand? Well, you know, uh, just saying hello uh, don't hurt, does it, Bernice? I don't want you to open your mouth in front of that man even to yawn. I had to lie to him to get him away from here. And I don't want you saying anything to bring him back. Uh, uh, all right, Bernice. Just pray he goes back to his flesh peddling in New York on that first train. Just as I thought, Bernice had lied to me. I was determined to get to the bottom of this double talk about Wilson more than ever. This had become more important to me than signing him to the usual seven-year management contract. When I got back to Wilson's trailer, there was a light inside. Who's there? It's Peter Harris again. Who? Peter Harris. I spoke to you a few days ago and... What do you want? I want to talk to you, Mr. Wilson. Go away. But I've come all the way from New York. I must ask you to leave at once. Look, Mr. Wilson, I'm not a detective. All I wanted when I first met you was to book you into the big time. But now there's something more. I think you need help. You need help badly. No, you're mistaken. Can I come in and talk to you? Oh, good heavens, no. Well, how about having a drink with me before the show? You look like you could use one. Please, now, leave me alone. Wilson. Wilson, don't you see what these people are doing to you? For some reason, you're a haunted man, and this carnival is the worst place in the world for Leave me now. Leave me, please. These people are all the help I need. Leave me alone. I'll be at the hotel overnight. If you change your mind, Wilson, call me. No, I was mad. If he wanted to rot there, go on with a carnival until it wasted away, it was no business of mine. I had a few drinks in my room at the hotel. Phone Gloria that I'd be home the next day. Went to bed. (sighs) 
Yes? Mr. Harris? Wilson. Can you meet me right away? Right, right away? What time is it? Well, I don't know. It's after midnight. It's 1, 1.30. Well, I... Please, please. I must talk to you. Can you meet me? Sure. Okay, where are you calling from? Uh, an all-night drugstore. Well, where is no, it? Wait. Wait. No, not here. Meet me at my trailer. Okay. And please, hurry. It took me longer to wake the cab driver in front of the hotel than it did to get to the carnival ground. I told the cab to wait and made my way through the dark and tents and trailers to number 17. Come in. What's the matter? Uh, Mr. Harris, I've changed my mind. I I want to leave with you tonight. Tonight? Well, what's the... Mr. Harris, you're the first person outside of the carnival I've talked to in more than two years. You're the first person I've had the courage to approach. Go on. I trust you, Mr. Harris. I can't see why, but I know you'll believe me and help me. I can't live like this anymore. Sure, sure. Now, just take it No, no, no. Listen to me. Two years ago, I killed a woman. A beautiful woman. I loved her more than I've ever loved anything or anyone in my life. When I tried to tell her how much I loved her, she, she laughed at me. I couldn't stand that laugh. I understand, Wilson. But that isn't exactly justification see, for she mur- and her son... Uh, she was divorced were working in this very carnival when I first saw her back in my hometown in Illinois. Yes. I fell in love. Oh, you can call me a rube, anything, but I was in love. I quit my job and followed the carnival for months. That's how much I loved her. And she laughed at me. So I shot her one night. And then I wanted to die, too. And when I saw her lying there at my feet, I, I wanted them to hang me, but... They laughed at me. They laughed at you? The law, the police, they didn't believe I'd done anything. They wouldn't let me give myself up. Where did you get this crazy idea, Wilson? It isn't a crazy idea. It's the truth. Look, lots of people get lots of funny ideas. They think about something they want to do. And they think about it so much that they they really believe they've done it. It was real from the beginning. I killed her. I did. But there was no evidence against me. Listen, Wilson, you're not making sense. You listen. He destroyed every bit of evidence so he could punish me himself. The police couldn't arrest or even suspect me. Who destroyed what evidence, Wilson? Her son, Oliver. Oliver? Yes, Mr. Harris. He's referring to me. A trick? No. Wilson was too upset to be tricking me. I wheeled at the sound of his voice, and there in the doorway stood Wilson's dummy, Oliver, a small but capable pistol in his hand. You are just as curious as Bernice said you were, Mr. Harris. Oliver. Bernice told me a lot about you. You had to know. And now you do. No, you're not... You shocked to learn I'm a midget. I must admit you gave me quite a start when you made yourself at home in the trailer this afternoon. But that was... That was me, Mr. Harris. Fortunately, I was already made up for the evening performance. Mr. Harris hasn't done anything, Oliver. Let him go. That depends on you. You see, Mr. Harris, Wilson is no ventriloquist. I guess that's obvious now. It is. Wilson murdered my mother, and I protected him from the police. But why? Why? So the law couldn't punish him. What satisfaction would there have been for me if they'd just hanged him? He'd been dead in an instant. Is that enough punishment for a man who has murdered your mother? No. He deserved more. And I've given it to him. I've punished Alexander Wilson for years. That's right, Mr. Harris. He's held this over my head ever since. Sitting on my lap at every performance, reminding me night and day. Well, Well, I've had as much as I can stand. So go ahead, Oliver. Shoot! Shoot! Oliver! Be sensible. If you pull that trigger there, here. They, Bernice and Arthur and everyone else. Bernice already knows, and now I don't care if the others do too. For heaven's sake, shoot me! Get it over with! Shoot me, you monster! Shoot me! With horror frozen on his face, Wilson slid to the floor, dead. Then Oliver turned on me, 
pupils of his eyes tiny with madness and his frail little body trembling. I'm afraid this is one act you can't book, Mr. Harris. Oliver. You wanted to know everything. Oliver, now wait, wait. I'm really sorry for your sake. He asked me to let you go, but under the circumstances. No. I... I'm sorry, Mr. Harris. It flashed by my head and landed quivering in Oliver's chest, a long gleaming knife blade. And there was Arthur in the doorway of the trailer with Bernice, his face like stone, watching Oliver crumple the little distance to the floor. Slowly, the faces of the others appeared in the doorway, silent. The terror I was holding back was a physical pain. I walked to the door and stood looking down at the little body lying awkwardly like a dummy now. A lifeless thing, unmoving, staring, even with the traces of a painted smile grinning up at me. This couldn't have gone on any longer, I suppose. The police will come now, and at last there'll be an end to it. Go home, flesh peddler, and forget all about us. I went home, but I haven't forgotten, and I'm afraid I never will. That was The Flesh Peddler from Suspense here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. Once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And we are in our January of 2019 Listener Library Month. We are going through some requests. And uh, that came to us from Gary. And thank you so much, Gary, not only for your uh, kind words and your email, but also for suggesting this. This is three episodes in a row now that I'm going to mention this, Mm -hmm. that I do not like to know anything about what I'm listening to. I just want to listen to it. I don't want to know that it's from a Robert Louis Stevenson trilogy. I don't want to know who the uh, actors are Mm -hmm. in it because... You don't even want to know it's a radio show. Don't even want to know it's a radio show. (laughs) I don't want to know English. (laughs) But, you know, then I can go in with this idea of I'm not thinking that it's supposed to be this or supposed to be that. Yeah, that Um, makes sense. So a couple things. First, it's impossible in this situation to not go, well, there's DeForest Kelly. (laughs) And it, interestingly, was distracting for me for a, a while, uh, minutes. But then I thought he settled right in, and I forgot that I was watching Damn It, Jim. And, <laughs> um, and I thought he was great. He pulls off a real, almost hard-boiled quality. Yeah, yeah, well, I think he rolls, by the way. I think it gets better as the episode goes on. Yeah. I think at the top, there's a little, uh, what are we doing? I'm just phoning it in. Then he gets better, the performance. The second thing, again, I did not know who was listening to so the knife thrower guy comes in. Arthur. I spent a very long time going, what cartoon is that <laughs> voice from? And it turns out every, every cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> so Tim writes this intro, or Joshua wrote this intro, and I'm reading it at the top, and I started laughing when we were doing the intro because I'm like, oh, he's the voice of everybody. <laughs> yeah. But here's where I pinpointed it and not mentioned by you and tell me if I'm wrong. Was he not also the voice in Fractured Fairy Tales a lot? He could be. Uh, but I'm sure it, someone will email us immediately and tell us. <laughs> he was Yogi Bear, exit stage left Snagglepuss. Mm-hmm. Man, that's crazy. That's quite a resume. By the way, every one of these that I just mentioned are the cartoons that came on at 8 in the morning in my elementary era, which meant that if I was watching those, I was homesick. <laughs> <laughs> so this yeah, episode he, made you feel sick. Is <laughs> Mr. Laugh Olympics. He's just the whole show by himself almost. <laughs> <laughs> he really is. Oh, can I have some water? <laughs> just keep reading. <laughs> Dawes. <laughs> um... They start out this episode with, this is a ventriloquist on his show, but it's going to surprise you. Yeah. So the challenge was laid down. I thought, no, it's not. And then, yes, it did. (laughs) (laughs) You'll never guess the twist. But what I also love is how they open it with, okay, these aren't the words, because I'm sure Joshua memorized the opening and he'll give it to But it's something to the fact of, hey, this is an old trope. This is another one of these Mm -hmm. ventriloquist things. But however, hang with us. There's an interesting twist at the end. I guessed it. Oh, wow. Yeah, I really early, and that's rare for me because I'm not that bright. I shouldn't say bright. I should say 
I go with the flow of story so well that I don't think much. <laughs> yeah. And Usually it, I scramble like, I can figure this. I can do I can Right. I don't this. do like, that. No, I get it this time. I said, that's a, uh, I don't know. What do we call it? A little person is the preferred term. Is it now? Yes. Okay. I'm 52. I need to be guided because I know the word they use in this ain't right anymore. Yeah. It's so clear a child actor that I think it's not. It's not? No. Do you have research on that? I, I looked him up. I can't remember. How, oh, he wow. might have been a child at the time. Okay. But he also is a little person. Oh, wow. That makes it much cooler. Then. I can't think of his name right now, which is... Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> but now I'm hoping I'm right. <laughs> I'm not just lying to you, but I was pretty sure that I... Because I listen, I get bored, and I just Google things. But... Well, I guess... <laughs> <laughs> it was clearly not the actor who played Wilson... It was a doing separate actor. another voice. Yes. So that is a little bit of a cue to me that it's maybe a separate entity. And so after I listened to this episode, I was like... I'm going to find out if this is a totally original take on this. And I did find out that he might not be entirely correct, as in there's a 1943 British film called The Dummy Talks, in which a little person detective masquerades as a dummy to find out who murdered a blackmailer slash ventriloquist. It's available to watch in its entirety on YouTube, if you have an hour and a half available. Yeah, no thanks. Isn't there a number of cartoons that are close at the tip of my tongue where that happens it's an actual person it's usually they're a baby then suddenly they've got a cigar <laughs> right. and they need to shave and they're wearing a diaper and it's right. uncomfortable for everyone <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment though when the dummy what's the dummy's name oliver yep. yeah uh, it seems mean now knowing it's an actual human to call it a dummy uh, but oliver comes in and he says he's holding a very small pistol and i went <laughs> Wait, if this is an actual dummy, then the image comes in your head of that wooden arm, you know, and the doll holding oh. it up. That threw me. I was like, uh, uh, please be a person like I think it is. I thought the most insulting moment, though, was when they're describing his death after he gets hit by the knife. Mm-hmm. And oh, they yeah. go, Oliver crumples the short distance <laughs> to the floor. I was like, seriously? You're going to make fun of his height in the moment of his death? Yep. <laughs> How's the weather down there? (laughs) They definitely forecast of like, this guy is really good at throwing knives. He's going to throw a knife at some point. Yeah. But just that casual, like, I can pin a fly to a penny. (laughs) (laughs) I have superhuman abilities. (laughs) I'm of narrative significance. (laughs) I will say that, first of all, let me ask this. Is this one? Dick Beals. Wow, look at you looking stuff up uh, quick. Tim has Tourette's, ladies and gentlemen. We should be kind to him. He just yells things out like, Dick Beals. Who is Dick Beals? Uh, give me another 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> Why did you just say Dick Beals? That is the actor who played Oliver. Oh, okay. thank you. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> we'll get back to Tim in 10 minutes. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I do also wanted to, to put in my experience listening to DeForest Kelly of the cast of Star Trek. I think all of them are amazing, as easily made fun of as they are in those roles. It's because they made really big characters Mm -hmm. out of basically Mm -hmm. flat kind of tropes. Mm -hmm. Uh, And DeForest Kelly, at the time, being like the elder statesman of the cast. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed listening to him in this because he's DeForest Kelly and and that Mm -hmm. sort of wry quality of him that implies a lot. Hard-boiled, even in this case, as you said. Dick Beals! (laughs) <laughs> here's what i was saying earlier what year is this i forgot 1957 uh, is this that era that you've talked about joshua where suspense started the slide where you don't think they're as good as they once were and with this episode this is the be- early part of this struggle i feel like something like this represents them trying like i said in the intro to take advantage of a change in fortune and be like who can we get who's up and coming can we Mm -hmm. find some crazy new young writers with Mm -hmm. absurd ideas and later they get to the point where they're just recycling old escape scripts and old mysterious traveler scripts and they delve into science fiction with very mixed results they're still going to be in the air for five more years after this I may have overspoke Dick Beals was four foot seven that's what you are (laughs) I'm not four foot seven (laughs) I'm taller. <laughs> uh, Beals provided the voice for the character Speedy Alka-Seltzer. Oh, yeah, right on. Okay, I can now hear that. 
I really enjoyed the suspense that was created in this episode of why can't we talk to him? Mm -hmm. Uh, The pursuit of I'm going to talk to him and the slow grind of the reveal. I'm not so sure of the reveal itself. We'll talk about that. But I liked the journey there from everybody denying access to him and being met with roadblocks and wanting to know why. Mm -hmm. Why can't he talk to this ventriloquist guy? So I enjoyed that part of it very much. I also thought maybe Oliver was either a little person or a child or some real human being. And I suspected that toward the middle. But what saves it is the reason behind this whole scheme. And that, to me, was the shocking, horrible twist. To torture him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a great line where he says, what fun is it to let the law and the authorities punish you? If I can do it, that's the satisfaction of me personally getting you for doing uh, that to my mother. Uh, I'm totally on Oliver's side. (laughs) (laughs) That's where I have a little trouble with this, where I can't decide where the authorial voice is. If we're actually supposed to sympathize with Wilson, there's a point at which Peter uh, looks at him early on and says, he had the saddest face I've seen in 15 years of show business, Mm -hmm. which... Hey, that's got to be a sad face. Uh, But also, I feel like throughout it, we're supposed to feel for him. This is a guy who went to a carnival, saw this woman, became so obsessed with her that he quit his job and followed her around. And when she dared to spurn his advances, killed her. He's a freaking monster. <laughs> right? I mean, like, really, really a monster. So I actually kind of wanted uh, Oliver to win in the end. But then, of course, we knew that uh, Arthur had to use his knives because <laughs> he was bragging about it. <laughs> I can hit a tiny person from a mile away, whatever he said earlier on. <laughs> on the topic of, like, the hard-boiled nature of DeForest Kelly and his character, I was fascinated and loved this ongoing sort of snide attitude people had to him and call him a flesh peddler and Mm -hmm. sort of rude to him as though he had some sort of seedy occupation of like talent agent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was like not that bad. However, when you look at it in the carnival context, they are used for their physical infirmities or uh, weirdness or yeah. things like that. So and spurned when they're not actually being yeah, on so stage. I think mm-hmm. you can understand it from that perspective. I mean, he's also kind of a dick. <laughs> he just will <laughs> not leave these people alone because he wants to win. True. He sees this talent and sees dollar signs. and Yeah. And one of my favorite lines is after he gets the call from Wilson at 1.30 in the morning. He says, it took me longer to wake the cab driver than to get to the carnival grounds. And that's the only line I wrote down, but there's just tons of them like that. So it's, it's got a nice rhythm to the dialogue that makes it feel, again, hard-boiled. I had never heard the term flesh peddler before in my no, life. Me neither. No, me neither. Which would go back to what we were just saying, agent, why is that looked down upon? But maybe it was at some point, and you were saying, Carnies, but if people were calling him flesh peddlers, maybe they were the scourge of the planet at some point. Well, at one point he says, I sell talent. So if you think of it that way, if the idea is that he is taking an unfair cut, someone who is taking advantage of people. Because in today's maybe not for everybody but like in my case i mean giving someone 10 to 15 percent is pretty fair deal if they're lining me up work you know and and maybe you're right maybe it was like you get the 10 15 (laughs) percent yeah um but you don't have like a secret twin who's growing out of your abdomen (laughs) you know i wish (laughs) (laughs) i think it's the carnival setting you yeah. don't have a secret twin growing out of your abdomen, do you? Because we should be doing a different podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, you're out. We got a new co-host. I understand. <laughs> to tell him to shut up. <laughs> Long time ago, the Minnesota State Fair used to have, uh, <clears throat> incorrectly, the freak show. And it was mm-hmm. called the freak show in the carnival section of the, the fair. And I remember being in high school and we would go. And um, 
I did it two years in a row before we were on our third thing we'd paid a buck to get into. And I came out and I said, I'm done with this. I don't know what we're doing, but these people, you'd go in and I don't want to get in detail. It was sad. It was sad. And you were just looking at their abnormalities. And a lot of them were just watching TV and you were watching them watch TV and they were just sitting there and, you know, they say like lobster boy. And it was a kid with deformed hands and he was just watching. I'm like, oh my God, what are we doing? But the best ever freak show attraction <laughs> on the carnival was in a freak show thing a big giant truck right there's a whale on the side painted whale yep. and the guy outside with the microphone is saying if the whale is not real you can have the truck and we we're like wow okay and we listened to this guy barker this for mm -hmm. a long time like this is happy, the, the whale. It's a real whale in the truck. We swear to God, you know, if the whale's not real, you can have it. Okay, we got to find out because uh, I'd really like a truck. <laughs> <laughs> and if I can find a loophole in this. And I went in and it was, man, it was a real dead mm -hmm. whale. And I never thought, oh, right, dead. It was just a big dead whale lying in a truck. It was crazy. How much wow. did they charge for you to go in? Look back at then, everything whale. was a buck. Okay. <laughs> it was like this a buck to go see stuff. Way back in the old timey days of the 1980s. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, the boy that turned into a snake was uh, a boy. And then the, the thing he was in filled up with smoke. And then the smoke would dissipate. And he had a costume on that made him look like a snake. <laughs> <laughs> I'd pay a buck for that. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Because first of all, I didn't feel bad for him. And okay, before we leave this, we have to talk about the weird commercial for folklore in America. Yeah. That was truly puzzling. Because at first I was like, did the guy who plays Hap from Autolite just stumbled drunk in the studio <laughs> and started yelling into the microphone. <laughs> I'm half wild horse. I'm cock out alligator. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be honest. I didn't follow the ad. I didn't follow what they were talking I, about. And I, I just went, I give up. <laughs> Bring DeForest Kelly back in. I didn't know what was happening. it seemed to be something like, you know, a lot of countries have their stories and America has their folk stories too. Buy folk stories. <laughs> so if any listener can explain what that was, whether it was from like the... Stop library, reading Russian folk stories. The Library of Congress <laughs> was trying to collect American folk <laughs> stories at that time. It was the 50s. That's when like the Smithsonian Folkway, they went around and collected old blues songs and old yeah. stories. So maybe it was a... Invest a, in a, urban a, myths. Yeah. <laughs> An effort to collect these. I, I don't know. It was bizarre, though. It was. It the was. hook hand guy could use your help. <laughs> the hook hand guy. <laughs> His story hasn't been told around a campfire for almost 30 years. All right, any other thoughts? Let's vote. All right. Tim. We were just talking about this, I think, last week of suspense has the challenge of competing against itself, so I will not call it a classic because so much of suspense is a classic. And I think this does not hold up as well as those classics, but it is still excellent. It is a uh, great uh, story and it was well told, which is always the case for suspense. So it stands the test of time. Yeah, I definitely think it stands the test of time. It's maybe more historically interesting than anything else because of the people involved. Mm -hmm. It's highly entertaining to listen to. It is not a great script overall in that it, Feels like it treads water for a big chunk of it. Just mm -hmm. uh, DeForest Kelly's character trying to get into the carnival and not succeeding until he suddenly does for no reason. Yeah. However, uh, like I said, the performances are so good and so fun. And the story is so out there. And the twist at the end of just making this creepy murderer's life a living hell. He says something like, sitting on my lap. Every day. I mean, it is a really <laughs> sick ending. That did cross ending. my mind of, well, yeah. that's got to be some rough rehearsals. <laughs> <laughs> rehearsals. Well, they had to rehearse it. It was a bit. <laughs> he had a fork right in his groin. <clears throat> I agree with both of you on everything that you're saying. It, it definitely is not one of the better suspenses because it's suspense. Uh, and then if you take it out of 
comparing it to itself, I think that it's okay. It's not that I didn't enjoy it, but uh, definitely not a classic. But I will give it stands the test of time, even though it's somewhat goofy in, in a certain way. Yeah. So I'm going to be very tepid on this one, but I by no means hated it. I've had plenty of those. <laughs> Tim, tell him stuff. Dick Beals. <laughs> <laughs> Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com. That is the home of this podcast. You'll find other episodes of this podcast there. It's a great way to get a hold of us. You can get a hold of us through a contact page, comment on episodes, click links to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, whatever means you find. Just let us know what you think. And if you have requests for shows you'd like us to listen to, that's a great way to do it. Uh, it's also information is there about our live shows because we do live shows. Yes, you can also go to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast. We would greatly appreciate it. We have all sorts of fabulous rewards, bonus content. Also, if you'd like to just write us a review or give us a rating on iTunes, that certainly helps as well. And definitely follow us on social media. Uh, as Tim said, we've got the Facebook stuff and Instagram. And I don't think we have Twitter yet, do we? We do. I'm very bad about it. Oh, we just have bad Twitter. <laughs> Am I running it? <laughs> no. Let's just say I am, and then we have an excuse. Great. I'm the Twitter guy. <laughs> Hashtag what? <laughs> I'm going to tweet that right now. <laughs> oh, okay, and next week we are wrapping up our month of listener requests. Oh, do I have to go back to work and find my yes, own? Yes, you do. February is all you. It's all episodes selected by Eric. <laughs> it's going to be CBS Radio Mystery Theater for the next six months, people. Uh, no, we are doing an episode of Lights Out called Cat Wife. <laughs> Until then... Look out! Dick Beals. A little less analysis and more action. Dick Beals.